85% of our students start in the lowest level developmental math course. 85? 85% start in the lowest level math course, which has a pass rate traditionally of 50%. So we end up with 50 students. In the second developmental math course, we have a pass rate of 40%. So of those 50 who made it past level one, only 20 make it out of level two. College level math, college algebra, has a pass rate of 50%. So of the 20 students who make it into college level math, 10 make it out. Well, we have a wide demographics of students. For example, we have students that have been returning after 20, 30 years. You know, they decided to change their career or maybe they never were able to get a degree and now they want a better job, so they come back. We also have students that come straight from high school. A few students that are still in high school and are through a special program, they can take some college classes. Um, but what they have in common is somewhere along their, their journey, they have skills that they have not mastered and they need it. Mm -hmm. And so they're with us. So one of the big motivations for picking ad an adaptive learning solution was that the students coming in, especially at the lower level developmental math course, have a range of skills from essentially fourth grade math, which is whole number operations, uh, up to, say, 10th or 11th grade math, which would be uh, graphing linear equations, doing rate problems, proportions, decimals, fractions, percents, and so on. And because we have such a wide range, uh, teachers inevitably teach to the middle. And the students at the bottom are lost in a couple of weeks. The students at the top are bored for the first eight weeks. And some of them stop coming and fail the course that they were so well prepared for just because after eight weeks of, of just being tired of listening to stuff they already know, they got in the habit of not attending class. And like the, the tortoise and the hare, right, the hare fell asleep and never finished the race. Most of the students we talk to seem to have internalized the lessons of self-regulated learning and feel empowered to learn. It's pretty good because like for example, say I'm doing a topic and I'm slower and Vivian's faster than I am. Mm -hmm. I could work by my own pace and then it's a professor there that I could raise my hand, excuse me, I don't understand this, could you help me with it? Because everybody learns at their own pace. Um, yeah, we are typically just sitting down on the computer screen, but we're sitting next to our um, classmates, so if there's a problem on it, I could ask my classmate. Like, that's, the, that's actually the best thing about Alex, is that there's an explain button right there. Like, as many times as you want, you can hit it. You can ask a friend, you could call the professor, you could ask the um, sub-professor, you could even watch a video. Like, it's whatever you want. <laughs> if you don't get it at that point, then it's, it's your fault. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> The new approach does place new demands on the faculty. For me, I would say to my colleague, this is hard work. Mm -hmm. um, you cannot, again, sit back and think that it's going to happen by itself. Your job is to ensure that you speak to each student every day. Mm -hmm. And when they leave, launch them for the next day or the next class. Your job is to observe that data, look at it closely, and be proactive in what's going to happen to that student next. Because you can almost always tell from the data and mm -hmm. student behavior if you're observing students what's going to happen next. When I first got to ASU, one of the first things I, I volunteered to do was to teach a large introductory chemistry class, you know, 150, 200 students. And, um, and I enjoyed it. I did pretty well at it. I got a teaching award for it. But I felt this is not a very good way to teach introductory science, and especially, especially to, to non-science majors, mm -hmm. for whom this may be, you know, the last, the last contact point they have with formal science education. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's not a very good way to do this because the lecture mode is inherently passive, right? It's inherently 
communicating the notion that uh, the teacher is the expert mm -hmm. and, and the student is supposed to somehow receive the wisdom from the yes. expert, which is not what science is, right? So science is really about problem solving. It's about learning how to get to answers. Um, and the lecture mode just, it, you're continually fighting against that. Mm -hmm. And there are, there are creative ways to try to do that. Um, and you can have laboratory courses that try to do that. But again, when you have 150, 200 students, your laboratory course, it's very hard to, it's very hard to break that down into small groups and get to the point where students are really doing true inquiry guided mm -hmm. stuff. So it's, what I'm hearing from you is this is almost a challenge of active problem-based learning for science. Right but then the challenge of how do you do that at scale of 150 students. Right. And so the combination is what's led you to this design. Right, well, well what led me initially to it was, was thinking that, okay, so there's gotta be a better way to do this. Um, and then, you know, not earth shattering to look at, you know, kids playing with video games and seeing, well, yeah. no problem with attention span there, very active, very dynamic, lots of problem solving. Why aren't we somehow using this kind of technology somehow in our teaching in a way that really works? What amazed me the most about it was more how the course was centered upon building concept. It wasn't about hammering in detail. They weren't trying to test you on how much can you remember out of what we're feeding you. Mm -hmm. It's you go through the slides, you go through the different sections, and you are building conceptual knowledge while you were doing it. Once you've demonstrated that you can actually apply the concept that they are teaching you, then you can move forward. And until that happens, you're going to be stuck exactly where you are, and you're going to have to ask help from other students in the class. You're going to have to use the resources available. They want you to learn how to solve problems. They want you to learn how to apply the concepts, and they want you to do it in a way that's going to work best for you. So it's, so it's multidisciplinary, very, various disciplines, but all held together by project problem solving, around Drake's equation. Yeah, we, one is. concept really ties it all together. And if you want to answer those questions around that kind of problem, like, you know, is there life out there? Are we alone? You can't do that with just like astronomy. You can't do that with just biology. It's, it touches everything. I mean, from like sociology down to like physics. Uh -huh. And those are very, very different disciplines. And so you have to be adaptable. Uh -huh. But I mean, if you rise to that kind of a challenge, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, I can honestly say, like I'm not, this is not hyperbole or anything. It is, it is my favorite class I've taken at this college. And it's a half semester online course. Yeah. By far the best course I've taken and I've recommended it to everybody I've talked to since. 